Well, hello, everybody. It's Pastor Kevin Swan, and we are excited for this Bible study series, another phenomenal book by Tom Rayner, uh, who is with Lifeway Christian Stores. Uh, we did a series some time ago called I Am a Church Member, and that was a great book uh, to help church members to really understand the call and the purpose of what it really means when you join a church, what's really expected of you. Well, uh, Tom came out with another book called I Will, which piggybacks off of the I Am a Church Member book. And this focuses more on actions uh, and the beliefs of how uh, we can make impact and what we are willing to do for God, not just in church, but what we're willing to do for God in our homes, in our communities, uh, in our families, in a world where Christianity and is, is declining to some degree and people are walking away from the church, we need more people that are willing to stand up, willing to declare the things of God, willing to serve and represent Christ in a meaningful way. And this book is incredible. And we are thankful to Mr. Rayner for writing this book. So we're going to go through it today. All we're doing is just the introduction. There's so much in the introduction that we can't even get to chapter one. So if you have the book, take some time to read the introduction. And if not, then we can give you some points along the way that will help you. Either way, let's begin our journey with the I Will book by Tom Rayner. And we're very excited about this series of I Will. And certainly we want to thank Tom Rayner, who is the author of the book, I Will. And certainly there's no way that I would ever attempt to uh, have credit for the work that he has done. Uh, a great book, small book, easy to read. And today all we're going to do is just the introduction there's so much in the introduction that we can't even get to chapter one yet. So uh, the goals for the series is going to be, um, you know, we, we believe here at Ivy in striving for spiritual excellence, that God is an excellent God and, and that we should not just do things haphazardly. We shouldn't do things in a mediocre fashion, but we should respond to God in the same way that he responds to us. And I believe that's in the spirit of excellence. And so as we strive for excellence, According to this book, then, we, we must look at and identify the personal and corporate things that impact our ability. There are some things that we know that God is calling us to do. And if you're part of a church family, you know that there's some things that God calls a local assembly or a church to do. But along with that, there are also some things that impact our ability to want to do those things. So what are the personal reasons why we don't always follow through with God's will and what are some corporate things that prevent us from focusing on God's will? And then also we want to, once we identify those things that limit us, we then want to find solutions to overcome those barriers. One of the greatest barriers that we tend to face is fear. Uh, we, we're just uh, afraid, for example, of coming to the front of the church and sharing our testimony. Or we are afraid of uh, doing something um, because maybe we don't know the response or maybe we don't feel like we're good enough or we're adequate enough. Maybe we don't believe we have the ability to do it. And fear is just one example. But as I share often, uh, every time I get up on Sunday to preach, right before preaching, I am afraid. I have some level of fear. But I have learned to push past the fear in order to get to the place of where God's will can be done. And fear never goes away, but I've learned to manage it better. And in the same way, we have to find solutions in our, in our personal lives to say, okay, this is a barrier. This is hindering me, but I'm willing to, to look past it or to acknowledge it and move forward anyhow so that we can do the will of God. And then finally for this series, we need to offer support uh, for one another. Uh, that we move from I might do it or I'll think about doing it to I will do it. And, and that's when it's in your will, that's when everything changes. You know, David said in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. Not I might do it or I'm thinking about doing it. I will do it. When something is in your will, everything changes. And that's when you have a conviction, when it's in your will. So God wants us to move from maybe or I'm thinking about it or considering it or I can't do it to I will do it. So our opening discussion question for today, and again, this Bible study series is designed for you to have dialogue and discussion if you're doing it in a group 
or if you're doing it individually, you can still think about the question on your own. But here's the question uh, for this study today. So for many people who attend church, you know, we tend to look at church from a negative point of view. And I'm not talking about outsiders. I'm talking about church members. It's interesting how when church members are discussing the church either to another church member or to someone outside of the church, in many ways, the conversation is negative. So why do you believe so many people in church view the church from a negative position instead of a positive one? And keep this in mind. If you are a church member and you're speaking to someone who does not attend your church and you're sharing with them all of the things that's wrong with the church, then why would that person ever want to come to your church if you're, in fact, not satisfied yourself? So we have to be careful about how we speak on and discuss things that are happening within our church to other church members as well as to those on the outside of our church. But I want you to pause the video now and have discussion on that question. Write your answers down and then we'll continue with the video. All right, if we were to admit then we would understand that, yes, in the church, there is a lot of negativity. There are a lot of things in the church that people see and view from a negative point of view, and, and we have to fix that. So here's the story of the introduction. And the introduction starts with um, a couple, in particular a wife uh, or a woman named Heather. And Heather was uh, married to her husband named Dan, and they had been together for some time, and they had eventually gotten divorced. Heather uh, and Dan had three children, of which Heather has custody of the three children. Um, when Dan and Heather got married, they got married, uh, and they joined a church, and they became actively involved. And at the time of joining, Heather was very excited about ministry and wanting uh, to do God's will and was excited about serving. Uh, but when the divorce happened, um, Dan had decided to uh, remarry, and the church had about 250 members. And Heather did not want to be involved with uh, seeing Dan and his future wife. And so she decided uh, to leave the church. But instead of joining another church, she did not go to church anywhere for three-plus years. Um, and so... The truth of the matter of the story is that Heather left the church not because of the divorce, but she left the church because she started having feelings uh, of ambivalence uh, when she would wake up on Sunday morning. For example, when she first joined, she woke up on Sunday mornings excited and enthusiastic and, and ready to serve and go to church, but then gradually, not anything that happened, but gradually she started waking up and not having that same sense of joy, not having that same sense of fulfillment, still uh, feeling blah about going to church. She knew she had duties and responsibilities. And so what ended up happening was those duties and responsibilities were now becoming the primary reason why she wanted to go to church, not to give God glory, not to praise the Lord, not to want to bless somebody. She went because she had to. She was needed. She had to serve in a ministry. And, and she knew that she had to be there. So she went from having joy to now having dread at going to church. And to be honest, this happens quite a bit, especially for those in leadership, whether you're a deacon, a trustee, a pastor, a minister, a first lady, any capacity where you're in church often as the leader, you have to be very careful because you can easily wake up on Sunday morning and, and focus on everything that you have to do as opposed to going to church and worshiping God. Our, our primary emphasis for going to church is to worship God. We worship him through song. We worship him through praise. We worship him through giving. We worship him through fellowship. All of what we do is centered around or should be centered around the worship of God. And leaders in particular can miss out on all of that because you are busy doing other things. And that busyness caused Heather to no longer have the same desire for church. And so while she got divorced, 
truthfully, she used the divorce as an excuse to leave, and then she never went back to church for three plus years. Well, after the three plus years, eventually, um, Heather got the tug to want to go back to church, and she realized that she needed to go back, not just for herself, but for her three children. Her children needed to be in church, and they were growing up, and she was a single mother now, and you know, trying to make it, and, and she knew that God needed to be in her life, but more importantly, needed to be in her kid's life. And so she started to go visit some churches. And when she started to visit the churches, all of the churches that she visited, she didn't really, quote, unquote, like. She found some flaws in all of the churches. And, you know, what she ended up doing was saying, okay, I'm going to connect with the church that I feel is the best of the worst. And, and again, in her mind, she's going around, she has a checklist, she's evaluating the church and the ministry, she's looking at what they offer, and she's also very careful to point out what's wrong with the churches. And so finally, one of the churches of which she entertained, um, the pastor and the first lady visit Heather in, in her home. And, and Heather goes in and, and talks very candidly about their church and, and basically says, your church is all right, but your church has some flaws. And, and the pastor and first lady are, are being very gracious, and they ask, well, would you mind telling us what you believe our flaws are in our church? And Heather proceeds to give the pastor and the first lady a, a, an article or a blog that she found online that kind of summarized how she felt about church and church experience. And the article was entitled, Nine Ways Churches Drive Away First-Time Guests. And here are the nine. And if you are a member of a church, I'm, I'm certain that you can identify with some of the nine that have been listed. Number one is unfriendly church members. Now, it's interesting because I'm a pastor, and I tell our congregation all the time that before I ever get up to preach, which is at the end of the service, visitors have already felt a certain spirit or a certain warmth or coldness of the membership. And the way they observe it is, first of all, by how members treat each other. So if visitors are looking in the congregation and seeing members sniping at each other or not being warm to each other or friendly to each other, then that's a sign to the visitor that it's no need for me to stay here because if, you know, if you're not going to be kind to family, then why would you be kind to me? So we must be very careful how we in the church members treat each other um, because people are watching. Number two is unsafe or unclean children's areas, especially in Heather's case or in our day and age with young families and people looking for places for their kids to go, them being able to trust uh, the youth workers and the volunteers, them being able to trust the safe spaces and making sure the areas are clean and sanitary are very important. Number three is uh, no place to get information. So once the service is over, there's not a designated place or location for visitors or even members alike to go to get information. Where do you go to find out about the choir meeting? Where do you go to find out about the ushers next meeting or what's going on in the church beyond the bulletin? If I want to join a, a ministry, what do I do or where do I go to be a part of that? When people don't feel like they're getting information, it drives people away. Number four is a bad website. And I can tell you firsthand that many people have come to our church and I asked them why, and the first answer is that they saw our website. And so um, you went to our website to get this Bible study, and some of you did. And so understanding the significance of the website, and, and Tom Rayner mentions that one, one thing has to be accessible to visitors is the, the service times that you do on Sundays and your address and phone number to the church need to be prominently displayed for people who are visitors to your church and looking at your website. Also, poor signage. People don't know where to go in the building. Now, most members know where to go because members have been there for, forever. But for those who are new to the building, where are the bathrooms? Uh, where's the office? Where 
is the fellowship hall. Uh, where are things in the building? You can't assume that everybody knows. Number six is inside a church language, and this is big because there is a culture within the church where people begin to speak church lingo, but to an unbeliever or a visitor, they have no idea what you're talking about. Things like the altar is a perfect example. Well, people who go to church are familiar with what an altar is or what the space represents, but an unbeliever has no idea what an altar is or where it is or where it's located. Um, if you have uh, sayings uh, or abbreviations for certain things in your church, like the uh, our Family Life Center, we call FLC for short, but for an unbeliever or a visitor, they have no idea what the FLC stands for or where it is. So you have to be careful of how you speak church language, especially the folks who are not familiar with your congregation. A boring or bad service, Lord have mercy. People, you have to have a service that is engaging, a service that um, is inspirational, a service that um, people will want to come back to. And, and there are a lot of things that, quite honestly, kill church services. Extended announcements kill church services. People doing things without a spirit of excellence kills church services. There's a lack of energy. There's, there's a sense of the church just moving along because there's an order of service and there's no intent behind it. A lot of things, and, and I could do a whole other video on this one, contribute to a boring or bad service. This is a key one. Members telling guests they are sitting in their seats. Now, in every church, people have what I call season ticket seats. They sit in the same space every single Sunday, and they can't hear from God unless they sit in that seat. And Lord forbid, if you walk in and on a Sunday morning and your season ticket seat has been taken, not by a church member who knows you sit there, but by a visitor who has no idea that that's where you sit. We have to be very careful of, of what it is that we are trying to do. And then number nine is dirty facilities, you know, the cleanliness of the building is important to people. But you walk in and you feel like it's safe, it's clean, it's well lit. You can get information. The service is engaging. Um, all of these areas are important. So as you look at your own congregation, if you are a member of a, of a church, maybe you might look at these nine and say, well, yeah, we do one, two, and three, or maybe we need to clean up some others. But this is a good list to go by uh, as, you, as you look at and evaluate your own church and ministry. So anyway, Heather gives this list to the pastor and first lady because, again, she's saying your church is okay, but you have some faults. And it was at this point that the first lady of the church made a very interesting observation for Heather. The first lady said to Heather, Heather, you have listed all of the things that you want from a church, but you should never choose a church simply based on what you want, but you should choose a church based on what you are willing to do. And here is one of the most important points that we can make about the book already in the introduction. So many people choose churches for the wrong reasons. And people become disillusioned in the church when, in fact, you chose the church for the wrong reason to begin with. When you join a church, you should never feel like you're joining a church based on simply what the church is offering you. Now, yes, I do understand having a church that teaches the word is important. And having relevant ministry is important. And yes, the church should be offering that. But as a person that's looking for a congregation or a church home, you should also be saying that while these ministries or these things are being offered, I can see myself serving in a ministry. I can see myself offering or contributing something that's going to make the church experience better. And the truth of the matter is Heather lost her fulfillment in church because she moved from what she was willing to do to what the church wanted, what she wanted the church to do for her. And she lost her joy because she had a different expectation when she went to church. 
she now expected the church to do for her. And one of the examples was, was that she was in a church meeting, and the pastor says, uh, I, we, I believe we should move our church service from 11 a.m. to 10.30 because at 10.30, um, we are, were able to get in and get out sooner, and research is showing that younger people prefer to get out earlier. Well, one of the members in the meeting stood up and said, we're not going to move to 1030 because we're not concerned about the people who are not members. We're more concerned about the members and the members like 11 a.m. service. That is an example of how people can become, quote, unquote, institutionalized in church whereby the focus of church is no longer me helping someone or blessing someone. Now the church is more about what I want and what I expect and what's in my best interest. And when that happens, we no longer go from uh, being uh, a person that is willing to do because we're now a person that wants to receive. And that's the greatest challenge or one of the greatest challenges of the church. So now if you read the introduction, then you would understand this transformation. And I want you to see it with me. It's amazing. So at the beginning of the chat of the introduction, Heather left the church that catered to her needs because she became miserable. The reason why she became miserable was because she was selfish and she was miserable because of her selfishness. Now, understand what's happening. She left one church because she felt unfulfilled. And the root of her unfulfillment was really selfishness. But now she's looking at other churches. And the other churches she's looking at from a selfish point of view. Which means that that was the reason why she was pointing out the flaws in all of the churches that she was looking for. Because she never looked at the church from what she was willing to do. She looked at it from what she wanted to get. And that made her miserable. And let me just offer this. It doesn't matter if you join church after church after church. If you don't deal with the spirit of selfishness, then you're going to carry that mindset and that spirit to the next church. And I guarantee you at some point, that church is going to make you miserable as well. Next, she became comfortable with being an insider. She was in leadership at the former church. And she grew comfortable with being catered to and the leadership of being able to make decisions and doing all the things in what I believe is in the best interest of me and the church. And now all of a sudden, she goes to look for another church and her priorities for joining the church were her own. What can the church do for me and my kids? So now she has become a church consumer. And I'm looking at church much like I'm going to look at Walmart or Target and I'm going to rate the church based on what I believe is in the best interest of me. The truth of the matter is, if we were to really be honest with ourselves, there are a lot, there's a lot of Heather in all of us. You may not want to admit it, but the truth of the matter is, we should all and can all see ourselves in Heather. Because we are Heather. Now, notice the transformation. She goes from that to now she realized that her greatest joy, once she was convicted by what the first lady told her, and she sat on it and she said, you know what? First lady was right. I got to get out the mindset of being, thinking about what's in my interest and getting back to the joy of serving. Now, notice this. Her joy came back when she started to serve again. She lost her joy when she went to church thinking that the church should cater to her needs. Do y'all see what I'm going? Joy is in the giving. Joy is not in the receiving. If you go to church solely for the purpose of receiving, you will not have as much joy as you will when you go to serve. She also realized that nobody in the church is perfect and that there are always going to be people in the church that get on your nerves that say stuff you don't like, that you may not get along well with, whatever the case might be. No church is perfect because the moment you walked in the door, the church became imperfect because nobody in the church is perfect. So when you have two imperfect people coming together, somebody's likely to say something wrong, somebody's likely to do something wrong, somebody's likely to make a mistake. 
And when you combine two imperfect people coming together with a selfish spirit, you're even more likely for something to happen. Now, notice this. You can be in leadership and still have a selfish spirit because Heather was in leadership at her former church, but she lost her joy because she became a selfish leader. What she then discovered was it was better to pray for others in the church that had a selfish spirit because she was reminded that she had one herself at some point. So when she began to pray for others, then what they were doing didn't bother her as much because she recognized that they had a selfish spirit. She also didn't get burned out or frustrated when things didn't go her way because now she realized that the church is not solely about me and what I want, but the church is about the glory of God. And finally, her attitude, which is the I am a church member book, began to match her actions, which is the book we're covering now, the I will book. So notice now, in order to be an effective believer, your attitude, how you think, must also match your actions. And when attitude and actions align, now you can have a favorable experience in church. You can have greater joy. You can have greater peace. People won't get on your nerves as bad. You won't be burned out. You won't wake up on Sunday mornings with a blah feeling, and you can do the work of the Lord because you go to church for a different perspective than what most people are. Now, my friend, if you look at this slide right here, I just want to ask a couple of questions. Can't you see yourself in this slide? And the truth of the matter is you can see all of us could see more of ourselves on the black side than the red side. Keep in mind also that how many of you think that most people in the church, which side of this slide do you think most people in the church are? Do you think most people in the church are on the black side or on the red side? I would argue that most people who attend church, including leadership, tend to focus more on the black side than the red side, and that's why we have selfishness, and lack of joy and lack of serving in the church because of our own selfish ways. And selfishness brings misery. All right, hope you're enjoying this so far. This has been a blessing. And again, this is only just the introduction. We haven't even gotten to chapter one yet. So the truth of the matter is Heather's story is our story and it underscores why so many people in the church are miserable. The root of the misery is selfishness. It's me, what I want, what I think the church should be doing, where I think the church should be going, what song I want to hear, what I want the pastor to preach, what the ministry should be doing, where the money should be going. All of it is rooted in the same spirit, selfishness. So here's the discussion question for today. I want you to stop the video. I want you to turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And in that, I want you to look at and identify how many things Paul says should be the mindset of the believer that is trying to do the will of God. So pause the video, look at Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11, and let's see what you have. All right, here we go. So Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. What do the verses say about the attitude and mindset of the believer? Number one, in verse 2, it says that we are to be like-minded. Verse 1, Paul talks about if there's any consolation, if there's anything of benefit to Christ. And Paul says in verse 2, fulfill my joy, make me happy, bless me based on anything that Christ has done for you. Bless me by, number one, being like-minded. Number two, have the same love for each other. And love is not based on what I get from you, but biblical love is based on what I am willing to do for you in spite of what you do for me. Have that same kind of love. I'm going to love you regardless of how you treat me. I'm going to love you even if you don't do right. It's my duty and responsibility to love you. Number three, be of one accord and unity. Try your best to get along with people. Do, don't do anything selfishly or of selfish ambition or conceit. But verse 3 says, how many people do you know in the church that do things because they just want to be seen? Or they do things because they just want the mic? Or they do things because they just want to be in front of everybody? Don't do anything selfishly. But it says in humility, we ought to esteem others better than yourselves. 
We have to get out of the spirit of competition in the church. It does not take away from you, your gift, your talent, and your anointing. It takes none of that away from you to encourage somebody or to esteem somebody or to give somebody their props. It doesn't make you inferior because you acknowledge that somebody is gifted at praying or is gifted at teaching or can sing a good song or can preach well. That doesn't minimize your gift. We have to learn how to edify and build up each other and learn that in building up each other, it doesn't demean me. It doesn't make me less. I don't lose my gifts because I acknowledge that somebody is gifted. We have to get out of that spirit of competition. Look after your own interests and that of others. Don't just come to church thinking about yourself. Who else can you bless? Who else can you help? Who else can you give a smile to and encourage? So what are you willing to do in that regard to be a blessing to someone else? Now, here's the best part, because when we get to 5 through 11, this is uh, one of the most beautiful parts of Scripture in all of the Bible. Because Paul says here, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That here's the mindset you ought to have. Because as a believer, our end goal is to look like Christ and to live like Christ and to think like Christ. Well, how did Christ think? Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 tell us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but get this, made himself of no reputation even though christ was god in the flesh he still did not come to the earth bragging about who he was he didn't walk up to people and say do you know who i am he let his ministry speak for itself he healed people he casted helped the blind he helped the lame to walk he forgave people of their sins he he ministered and He had no reputation of himself. People kept asking him, are you the Messiah? And he kept saying, this is not my time. It's not my time yet. Just let me do what I do. And it's amazing how he just let his work speak for himself. We ought to have the same mindset in the church. As a matter of fact, Christ took the form of a slave. Now imagine, you're at the top of the food chain. You could have come to the earth any kind of way you wanted, and you come in the lowliest position possible a slave. Paul said, let this mind be in you. Christ humbled himself to God the Father's will and was obedient even to the point of death. But at, but because of his obedience and death, then God said, I will exalt you and give you a name that is above every name. Thank you, Lord, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? That means that when you're willing to serve, when you're willing to not put yourself first, when you're willing to be obedient and sacrificial in your own life for God's glory, that's when your elevation comes. That's when your blessings come. That's when your favor comes. And so I hope you've enjoyed this Bible study today. Here it is. Joy and selfishness do not go together. I guarantee you in places of your life, where you've lost your joy, especially in the church, may also be the same places where you feel like you are wanting something or there's a selfishness there. And if you were to break that selfishness and turn your attention to blessing others, your joy would come back. Number two, we use at our church the four core values, and our four core values are love, service, hospitality, and excellence. All four of these core values are significant to true fulfillment and blessings as a church member. When I love, when I serve, when I'm hospitable, when I do it in a spirit of excellence, that's my joy, not what I get, not just to hear the choir sing my song or the preacher to preach what I want them to preach. It's bigger than that. And the last thing I want to leave with this on this Bible study is what are you willing to do for God? And his kingdom. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to do for God and his kingdom? Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's Bible study. Uh, It's just the introduction, and we got some more to go. Thank you, and be blessed. 
You know, the truth of the matter is all of us can see ourselves in Heather. All of us have had experiences in church if you've been in it long enough where you tend to want to gravitate to the things that you want and desire. And we tend to lose uh, the joy sometimes that comes from church because we are more centered on what we want instead of what we're willing to do. The introduction was fantastic, and I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. Uh, the next time, we'll actually start with chapter one. Until next time, be blessed and be a blessing to someone else. Take care.